right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I'm joined by Monica Rogers, who is in Rhode Island on the other side of the US. How are you doing, Monica? Hey, John. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, and uh, Monica is the president of Revelation Media. You're a serial entrepreneur with over 30 years of business experience. And, and now you have, uh, you've done what's called the Revelation Project, which is a mission to disrupt the status quo and activate inner transformation, giving women the tools and guidance to reveal, remember, reclaim, and reframe, reframe their rightful place as emerging and powerful leaders in the world. Um, okay, so Monica, um, what, what, what was the driver behind the Revelation Project? Well, I, it was actually my own um, trance, what, what I call the trance of unworthiness. You know, I, I was at that point in my life where I realized that I was um, exhausted, I was confused, I was unhappy. And yet the, from the outside looking in, everything looked perfect. So a lot of women can relate to that. You know, there's this kind of drive to make it all look pretty and beautiful. And yet on the inside, there's often a tremendous amount of unhappiness. And that has so much to do with the fact that we're not being authentic to who we truly are. I uh, know, absolutely. And and so what is, why do you think it is in particular, I mean, obviously you're, you're focused on women, why do you think in particular that women, uh, you know, aren't able to relate to their, or, or are prevented from being their authentic self? I think because we're, we're conditioned in a lot of ways to kind of conform to gender norms. And in our society, uh, you know, women can't really freely be either male or female. So there's there's a lot of pressure for a young girl uh, to not be too girly or too feminine or too emotional, right? And then there's also uh, that idea of if she's m too masculine, right, that she's, she's also kind of um, you know, got issues as well, anger issues or, or bossy or any of those things. Yeah. So as uh, so obviously um, when when, you know, uh, girls grow up and to become adults and that, um, what are some of the what are some of the ways that this manifests itself? Well, I think as as girls kind of grow up, uh, one of the things that I talk often about is the fact that in order to really um, kind of continue to wear the masks, women often will numb themselves. I call it a, a almost disembody in order to really, mm -hmm. um, in order to really survive some of the feelings um, that are counterproductive um, to, to what they're actually feeling. So there's this sense of, you know, in our society, we tend to objectify women at a very young age. So that's a very tender, tender time for young women. And I think in order to kind of, um, survive those feelings, you know, of feeling objectified, of not feeling safe in their body, they end up going up into their heads um, or disembodying and numbing out so that they're not feeling so intensely. And because they've been taught that emotions, you know, are, are to this or to that or not to have them, you know, that, that also doesn't feel like a safe place for them to be inside of their own bodies. So oftentimes you have women who are making decisions because they're not actually trusting their body mm -hmm. to tell them, to show them the way, uh, you know, and so we can't oftentimes, and if you kind of look into the neurobiology of women, we are, um, we're, we're designed to intuit the world through our sensory system. So if we're not embodied and we're kind of trying to be more logical and in our heads, that's where there, there comes to be, you know, um, a discrepancy. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's interesting. A couple of things I want to draw on there, but, uh, uh, interestingly enough, uh, you know, we we do we do obviously uh, celebrate logic over intuition and that. I mean, I think it, in general terms. But what I just wanted to come back to something you said there about the objectification and you know young girls coming into women. I mean, we live in a strange culture that sends these mixed messages, don't we? On the one hand, 
you know, you have more people saying, okay, you know, empower girls and women and that. And at the same time, you have a culture that, shall we say, as you say, objectifies, you have a, you know, popular culture that maybe, you know, sexualizes children at a very early age and all of that kind of stuff. So it, it's weird. So there's these two kind of conflicting messages coming and sometimes coming from the same sources. Correct. Yeah. They are, they are oftentimes come. And so, so John, help me understand the question again. Yeah. So I was just saying, so how, how do you deal with a culture that is sending these mixed messages on the one hand, you know, like popular culture may say, oh, in, in power, you know, women should be in power. And at the same time, they're still objectifying and they're still, um, as I said, like, you know, sexualizing children at an early age and stuff like that. So this is, this is a very, as I said, it's, it's one thing when you're getting messages coming from different places, but sometimes they're coming from the same place at the same time. Okay. Got it. Yeah. It, that's very true. Right. So, so I think it is a, a matter of, um, young girls becoming educated and women, of course, there's, there's mm -hmm. a certain point, you know, where you say, we can't necessarily avoid some of this socialization because it's just still the way mm -hmm. uh, things are. And so there are, I think, um, interventions. And of course, talking to our daughters, being able to actually put some language around this, being able to point to something and help young girls actually see what's happening um, as it's happening so that they can start to discern the difference. Um, when we tend to normalize how the society is, that's when you know, girls grow into women, not really understanding that they're kind of living and breathing this environment all the time. So as, as older women modeling, you know, and being mentors to younger women, we, we really have to be responsible to point this, these things out. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing you mentioned that I wanted to come back on was that idea of trusting yourself. Um, so there is, um, so when you come into the workplace, right, is, you know, we, we celebrate logic, we celebrate, you know, decides all these things. And we really do play down intuition. because I was talking to somebody the other day about this, we really play down the role of intuition and, and all of that. Uh, because that doesn't, because that that doesn't seem as, shall we say, as based in reality as the other, the logic part, and yet uh, intuition still plays a large part in in a lot of the decisions. A lot of successful businesses or success people being successful in their lives, it comes down to intuition. Um, so, it's difficult, obviously, for women when they come into the workplace because they're coming into a place that doesn't place a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of faith in, in intuition or emotion. Well, yeah. And it's not necessarily about throwing the baby out with the bat, the mm -hmm, bathwater, sure. correct? So what we yeah. really want to be focused on here is really integrating both those, those, the logic and the intuition and using it and discerning, uh, you know, kind of I think it's okay, for example, for um, a woman to be in the workplace and to use both logic and intuition. You know, that's that's showing kind of a, a more whole approach to making decisions, right? Because when we eliminate our intuition or when we eliminate our emotional, um, you know, uh, compass, so to speak, then, and it's all logic based, it's not necessarily um, good either. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think the bigger message here is about kind of where are we allowing more of these feminine uh, energies to coexist with the more masculine? You know, there's this theory that um, I, I, there's this prophecy, uh, I believe it's the, um, I'm going to, forget the name, the Baha'i, I think it's the Baha'i tribe that uh, talks about the bird of humanity. Uh, Lynn Twist talks about this a lot. She's a strong mentor of mine. And it's this idea that the, the right or the right wing of the bird is overdeveloped, right? Has, has, has actually become violent or toxic. Mm. And the left wing, which is the feminine part of the bird, uh, is underdeveloped. And it's this idea that we need both wings in order to soar, you know, that humanity needs to have both wings st strong, not too strong, right? Um, one or the other, that they're both uh, a big part of the harmony that we're trying to achieve as a human race. 
Yeah, no, that's that's fascinating. And, and let's face it, I mean, we're kind of the world we live in seems so unbalanced, uh, uh, you know, today. And um, and it seems so that we almost encourage people to go to, you know, to, to go to extremes, if you like, you know, to get full on in one area or full on in another area. And to your point is, it seems like we're we're ignoring um, the, the, the the yin and yang, the fact that it's it's always the balance and the combination of things. And I think, and and obviously, I think that it even probably becomes even harder for for women in the workplace because of, as I said, you know, we celebrate in many ways, I guess, the masculine traits. Correct. And, and I do believe, you know, that more and more women, as we start to recognize these feminine energies as just as powerful, right? And, and it's not, again, about either or, it, it is about mm-hmm. both, and it's about the integration of both. And so I think that as we become more well-rounded in these in this understanding and start to understand that this actually also plays into uh, things such as how we treat the planet, right? And so when we even look at the fact that we call the planet Mother Earth, um, you know, there's this idea of really, if we continue to ignore or denigrate the feminine, we're, we're really putting ourselves in peril. We really do need to think about, you know, there's the economy, you could call that kind of a masculine energy, and then the ecology, which is the feminine energy. Again, having both of those coexist, integrated, working together, we wouldn't necessarily then be, you know, facing the sixth extinction, you know, as it go- comes to global warming and really destroying the very place that we live and hold dear, you know, to human life. Mm-hmm. So, so tell me a little bit about the actual Revelation Project itself. Um, then how do you, how do you work with, with women and what is the, what is the process? Sure. So, uh, well, first of all, I have a podcast. And so many of the topics that we actually talk about are things like the divine feminine, but also, you know, the Revelation Project for me is about is again about both. There's the physical world and then there's the non-physical world and we mm-hmm. re- we live in both. And so it's really about normalizing both of them. It's about talking about the fact that, um, you know, we, um, we've forgotten that part of the mystery of life is about being able to leverage and use what we can see in the physical world, but then also to develop our and trust what we can't see, you know, and a lot of people would call that our relationship to spirit, you know, and it's this idea that the revelation project for me is about really revealing um, all of the barriers that keep us from integrating with these both both energies and all energies and being able to really approach our lives from a more, more holistic more fulfilled um uh embodied understanding of what we're here to do i often also say that you know the revelation project is of course i'll offer group coaching and um online courses for women, but it really is about, um, you know, I say that everybody who does the revelation project is really doing their own revelation project. Mm. I often say like, do your own project, right? It's not, I'm not going to do your project. You're not going to do my project. Um, And the revelation project for me is a spiritual practice. It's really about continuing to put my life inside of my project. And oftentimes what I'm asking myself is, what is wanting to be revealed right now, you know, and really using those energies, both energies, um, the masculine and the feminine to, to navigate my life. Yeah. And, and it's interesting what you say about the, 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 if you like the spirit world or the or spirituality, because I, I think we in many ways live in a culture that uh, a pervasive, even pop culture that celebrates the temporal world completely. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, and maybe pays a little bit of lip service um, to, to spirituality or the, or the spiritual world, but they definitely don't, they definitely seem well out of balance, um, certainly in pervasive culture today. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's true, John. I think, you know, there's, there's also this idea that um, we live in a very binary dualistic, right? It's, it's, again, it's that either or. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a disservice to all of us. I think that we 
also have to recognize that we are, you know, spiritual beings having a human experience. And so when we negate or neglect that side of our lives, we often find ourselves depressed. Um, And this is where so much of the, um, I think, angst, anxiety, feeling this separate this separateness from who we really are. Um, And when we're allowed to actually, I think, explore that, integrate that, embrace that, allow that, that's when we start to really experience life as mysterious and wonderful and kind of have the appropriate level of awe. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I do think that probably this last year with the pandemic and lockdowns and, you know, isolation and all of that has probably... In many ways, I think it has uh, revealed the some deficits that we have in our lives. This, you know, as you said, the spiritual deficits. I, I see people today who who almost cannot exist with themselves, if you like. I mean, they can't be alone. They can't be with themselves. They can't be with their own thoughts. They either have to be with people or they have to be on their phone. They have to be constantly, um, you know, talking or texting or they have to be, you know, social media spamming or whatever it is. But it just seems to me that uh, it's there. there's some void that they that is filled with that. And, and it's almost like people are afraid of the silence. I think they're afraid to be with themselves and their own thoughts. I, I couldn't agree more with you. And again, I think that that is such a um, is it's such a tragedy, right? Mm-hmm. Because I think again, it's we have to look at these things as like exercising a muscle, right? And it's we're not going to get it all at once, but um, you know. And so this idea of kind of practicing, even in small amounts, um, mindfulness or whatever that is for you, right? Like I'm somebody that doesn't easily meditate. Uh, it's just kind of my human design, my mind, I, I kind of have to know that like my mind is always going to be on the go. Yeah. But but if I'm walking, right, I can access like a meditative state or do right. So it's what can I do? What are these little incremental things that I can do to actually start to reveal? And this is what I call actually, I love that you talked about, um, you know, the pandemic. So I'm going to go back to that in a second. But what I call the the revelation spot is the spot just outside of our comfort zone. It's where we start to have those aha, right? Like, and it's, it's, again, it's not about doing it all at once, but it's about kind of really going toward the things that we resonate, even if they scare us a little bit, because that's that inner GPS that I was talking about that's actually directing us toward the thing that is going to open something up for us. And we tend to live in that comfort zone that I say is killing us because that's mm-hmm. that place that you were talking about where you know we can't stand to be with ourselves. We can't stand to be with our thoughts. Look, the thoughts are never gonna stop, right? It's That's part of how we're all designed. And so we have to learn to be with what is, and also learn to kind of practice these ways, these tools of, of being present, of being mindful, of giving ourselves access or portals into self-liberation. And this Mm -hmm. idea too, of the pandemic, you know, a lot of us refer to it jokingly as the apocalypse, but if you were to look at what that word really means, it means to reveal. And so when you think about what has been revealed, as you said, by the pandemic, what has been revealed is kind of what's not working, what's not Mm -hmm. serving. And so again, it's like the world is also doing its revelation project simultaneously. And we've all got to look and see what's here and make some discerning choices right now for ourselves, (laughs) for our planet. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I I I totally agree with you, and I think the I think that uh, yeah, I think the pandemic is as you know as tragic, obviously, as it has been for the people directly um, impacted, losing people and all of that. But the um, but it also, as you said, I mean, it it is has kind of oh shone shone a light on on areas of our lives. It's a collective experience, but it's an individual experience too. And I think that is that's where a lot of people have struggled in that it has shone a light on their lives, and perhaps that light maybe has revealed things that are, are uncomfortable. Because let's face it, I mean, if you're if you're jumping in the car at six a.m. in the morning and you're commuting for two hours to work, and then you're all work all day, and then you're commuting two hours home, and then you're getting home late, and it's very easy to to get consumed in your busyness and just block out everything. 
It is indeed. It is indeed. You know, I, I often call that also the mess, right? It, I mm -hmm. call it the mess because, you know, it, there's our humanness, you know, we're all a human being. So we have like our humanness, but then we also have our human mess and none of us can avoid it. And part of the deal <laughs> is that, you know, like we will suffer until we choose ways of being that actually liberate us from that suffering. And so when we're in the suffering, it's just about noticing like, oh, hey, I'm suffering, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and making a small choice again, that, that incrementally starts to shift how we, how the world shows up for us. But if yeah. we don't, if we don't actually start to change, nothing is going to change. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. And I just wanted to come back briefly to what you said earlier about, you know, um, you know, meditation, because I think sometimes people think, okay, well, if I'm going to be with myself, you know, and access my thoughts, then oh, well, I have to learn how to meditate. But yeah, as you said, it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for me either. Um, but there are so many other ways you just said, you know, going for a walk or whatever. I do martial arts. And to be honest, when I do martial arts, I, my mind clears because I can't, I'm, I'm, I, I can't think of all the other things going on. Um, and it's, and it's a very liberating experience often for me because you get those moments of, you suddenly realize this afterwards, you just think, I don't know what I thought about during this whole period, you know, but I certainly wasn't thinking about work. I wasn't thinking about other things. And I think it's really important for people to find something that clears their mind, even if it's only for, you know, an hour or so. Completely. I, you know, and I, I love that you said that too, about, you know, you do martial arts for somebody it, it's, it's driving, right. Yeah. Uh, for somebody else, it may be, um, you know, that physical activity or even just taking a, some time to just breathe, you know, just, just to center ourselves and breathe and relax the body, you know, even that is, is really that meditative state that we want to try to keep practicing being in. And it's, it's either the, you know, I often talk to you about the fact that, you know, if I notice I'm wearing my shoulders as earrings, right. It's this <laughs> idea of like, Oh, noticing and just breathing for a minute. It just, and, and expanding. And, you know, I, I love to the idea of the breath is spirit. If, if we're catch ourselves, not breathing, you know, like what kind of a life are we living if we're actually not breathing? Just allow ourselves to really notice, take that breath. And then suddenly there's more expansion. There's more, more ability to really be with what is. Yeah, no, I I love that what you just said because it's it's very it's simple yet powerful advice, and I think that I think there's a great starting point for anybody who's listening or watching this is if you're if you're feeling overwhelmed right now and disconnected and all of those things exactly start with taking a step back for a moment and just breathing and just calming you calming yourself down so then you can open yourselves to open yourself to the possibilities. Yeah, and and. You know, it also to, instead of, because I do think it's a choice, of, right, to, mm -hmm. to be, to be, instead of being scared about like what, what could be revealed, I think a lot of people focus on what they're going to lose versus what they're going to gain. And what I really love is this idea of like, what gets revealed really does get healed if we allow it to kind of show up and we can just get curious about it, you know, instead of like making it wrong, instead of making it mean something terrible about ourselves that, you know, we've discovered that we're tense all the time. Like if you notice it, just kind of you know, allow it to be, to, to just inform, inform us without, you know, needing to activate our inner critic again, right? It's just, again, these practices that slowly but surely allow us to start changing how we show up. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I think that's perfectly put. Um, and, and a great way to end this. This has been fascinating, uh, Monica. I really appreciate you taking the time out today. Um, all of Monica's information will be below this video and all the links. Uh, but before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself. Oh, well, so I'm a co-active coach and a little bit of a feminist scholar. You know, uh, I love, I really do love um, 
super curious. I love humanity. I love anything that has to do with, you know, learning more about the human experience. And um, I'm practicing like everybody else, right? It's, it's kind of like, it's, there's no arrival point. I get that. <laughs> it's, it's always about getting to the next revelation for me. And so, uh, you know, for your listeners, I just want to thank everybody and you can find me at join the revelation and you can certainly listen to the revelation project podcast, talk about all kinds of exciting, um, often taboo subjects that nobody really wants to talk about. I, I love revealing conversations that are kind of offer alternative viewpoints and, um, yeah. And so thank you. Thanks for having me. I've just enjoyed this so much, John. Yeah, thank you, Monica. Yeah, this has been great. I would encourage people to go check out the, the Revelation Project and all the work Monica is doing. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. See you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thanks, John.